what we're doing is we're training all direct staff. We have 18,000 DOC employees, uh, 12,000 direct staff, and we're training the entire direct staff in yield theory on how to communicate more effectively. What that looks like is a series of trainings, follow-up trainings, you know, all the continuing education and all that kind of stuff. But what I, what, what I do with the prison system, and I do this all over the country, but I do this a lot in Pennsylvania, and that is I go into a prison for a period of time, and I basically implement yield theory by going – well, first of all, I'm literally meeting people where they are, um, both officers and the inmates. And I will go in for uh, – if it's Pennsylvania prison, I tend to go in for six months at a time. And I go in and I'm working with staff constantly, not only doing trainings, but being there with them, watching what's happening. Because, my goodness, it is one thing to go interview. So if you're a consultant and you get to go interview people, you go, okay, great, I'm getting a sense of it. But if you go sit with them for a day or two, okay, oh, I have a better sense of this. But when you sit with people for four to six months, it's a whole different ballgame because guards are let down. Uh, people are more open. You're seeing, they think you can't put on an act for four to six months. So you can put an act for a couple of days, but you can't put an act for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And so you're really having a chance. So what I do is I get a chance to see what it's actually like. And then my role, because I'm working with all people on all shifts, I'm di- at, at prisons at different times, I- I'm able to kind of be incognito. Um, my personal approach, if you're listening and you don't know what I look like, I'm a a bald headed guy with tattoos and a beard and I dress in a t-shirt and jeans. So when I go in, people are always like, Oh, this guy must work maintenance here or whatever. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and He's I working on the HVAC kind of move without people knowing what I am, or who I am and what I'm doing. And then I get to get a really good insight as to what's happening. So when I go into these prisons, I'll do work with inmates. I'll do like groups, I'll do individuals, but individual sessions, and maybe this is a really good image for people to have. If you're, if you're driving, don't do this. But if you're not driving, here's what I'd love for you to do. If, you, if you're in a safe spot and you don't need to be operating something, I'd love for you to close your eyes and imagine this. But imagine you're in a very loud environment. You're standing in front of a door that's a prison cell door with a small uh, three-inch narrow window. And it's a three-inch thick steel door. And it's very loud, and the only communication you can have with the person on the inside is if you lean your your mouth a little closer to one side of the door so it can kind of echo through there. And you definitely have to speak up when you speak. And this is the this is what a one on one interaction looks like. Um, so if you feel comfortable, go ahead and open your eyes if you have them closed. But but that's what a one on one interaction looks like. And in fact, if an inmate wants to tell you something that he or she doesn't want others to hear. They do what I say, they call a step back. They step back off the door because that way other inmates' cells who face their cell can't see that they're trying to tell you something that they only want you to hear. I don't know if I said that clearly. but That's fascinating. So um, so the, the sound can be picked up by other people if they happen to be leaning against their own uh, walls or something? <laughs> Right, and then, and then the voices move through the pipes. I, I, you're not really oh, wow. going to get privacy that other people aren't going to hear. And when I say when you have to lean in, I say you, it's not like you're sitting having like I'm sitting in a chair talking to someone else, or I'm standing at a door and just talking through. And I, like you have to kind of maneuver if you really want to be, you know. And this is the part that's like this conversation, this dynamic. That's a, an everyday interaction. It's literally every time you interact, and so. That's something that if you haven't been on the inside, you don't recognize that plays a role. And it's it's the whole the whole when you're in there, when you're immersed in the setting, it's you, it's for me. That's how I've gained the experiences I've had. I, you know, Jake, I've done things where I've stayed afterward, where inmates thought I was gone and officers thought I was gone, and the stuff I learned was some of the best stuff I've ever learned. So people do put on an act while you're there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially at first, like especially at first and for the first couple months. Absolutely. So my role, because of my role, um, a lot of guys will think um, that I'm, I'm there to get that. So I will make things happen. But when I make things happen, I'm not making things happen like um, I'm just demanding it. Like, for instance, I just did a uh, Supermax prison where I did this uh, this whole movement with the inmates 
around inner peace, education, and legacy. And so we did this movement, and I said, look, I, I, we, and, and I'm just to sum because this is the, we'll talk about this. Maybe you and I have talked about this one on, on either my show or yours in the past, so we can direct people to that. But for this purposes, I just want to focus on this. So with the inner peace, that there was a, there was a reason behind that. With the education, what that entailed was inmates getting more books in their um, block time, where they previously were not allowed to have books. Well, this happened. This occurred. We, we made this happen. Now they're getting books where they never were previously getting books. Hmm. Um, and so when I talk about making things happen, so I'm uh, making this type 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 of stuff happen because look we, we need a change we need a change but you need to but you need to be in there and understand why it's happening and so i think what the officers kind of buy into with me is they know that i know what it's like for inmates to try to play me mm-hmm. and inmates have my respect because they know i'm also training the officers and i'm there to help all of them that's um, that's my goal is to help all of them Quick question. Why is it so loud in prison? Because I think the metal, it's metal doors. Um, people are asleep at different times. Um, they don't, uh, so there's a lot of kind of the junior high mentality. If you kept me up last night, I'm keeping you up tonight. And if you put a hundred people in a room together with that mentality, Oh, okay. And and thirty of them have that mentality. So it's not like there's a, a bunch month. of screaming and shouting and fighting. It's just noise, just banging and it's, well, tapping. Well, sometimes it's noise. Sometimes it's fighting. Sometimes it's something called gang warring. And gang warring on the door is uh, when you tell all the worst possible things you can say to somebody else who's also on your unit. Hmm. Um, and then they are also fighting. I mean, obviously, you're not going to physically fight because you're locked up. Right. So that's called gang warrant on the door. Interesting. So it, it sounds like it's actually a fairly safe place, but yet um, you're not interacting with these guys like face to face or these gals, I should say, uh, except in very controlled circumstances. Because I know you've done groups too, right? Yeah, and there were definitely groups out in. I probably wasn't clear that a lot of stuff I was probably just describing was the work I do in restricted housing units or solitary confinement. But, um, yes, I do groups with people who are in transitional housing units who are getting ready to get out of prison. There are no uh, – any kind of restraints or anything like that. We're just men in a group talking. Uh, mm-hmm. and that looks like a typical classroom. Um, so, yeah, we, in any given maximum security prison, you're going to have a variation from people who are getting ready to get out to people who are struggling in the worst possible situation. I mean groups in a, in a restricted housing unit look like individuals sitting in – in restricted cages. I mean, that's really what it looks like. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a lot of people get stunned when they first go into prison and realize that that's real. I remember my wife was watching a movie one time and there was one of those cages and she said, that's so silly. That just made this not real. She was like, that could never be real. And I was like, I actually run groups with guys sitting at those. <laughs> like that's absolutely real. Um, and so it's it is shocking because you say, how are people treated like this? But again, there are so many facets to this conversation. I mean, I, I fight for prison reform. I fight for these guys. I fight for the changes that they can make. I'm also not naive to and privy to and have observed and watched some of the pain that gets caused. Um, so I think that that's kind of been always been my advantage. I see all these different sides. I'm not coming in there, ooh, hey, listen, the inmates are all treated terribly, or coming in there saying, ooh, the officers are all treated terribly. You know, I, I kind of see that we all have things to work on, and that's my role is to help people in all the areas work on that stuff. You're building consensus is what it sounds like, and collaboration among people who share an environment. You know, they all got to get along, hopefully, you know, safely, and hopefully there's some, some rehabilitation that goes on because you don't just – trip and stumble one day and accidentally end up in a long prison sentence usually there's a long <laughs> behavior that leads up to that and those behaviors have uh reasons behind them and those reasons often are rooted in mental illness i mean this is a mental health podcast and um I- i'm wondering how much of your work in there is actually helping those guys to and gals because i don't want to i know you've had some great stories about the the females in prison they um they have a history of being mistreated, abuse, neglect, uh, violence perpetrated against them that then, you know, gives rise to these behaviors that then land them in, in the corrections uh, system. And I'm wondering 
you just talking about outcomes and what you expect out of the work. Are you seeing wholesome rehabilitation where people are actually like healed and walking in freedom? Um, or, no, what? no, but here's what I am saying. Here's what, here is what is different. So it, you're right. Historically, absolutely. Historically, people who struggled with, uh, mental health, uh, challenges were abused and neglected at this day and age in this state. And there's something called in antiotromia. We go from one extreme to another as a culture. So yes, there was that extreme where they were treated horribly. We've moved to the other extreme where people who can be identified struggling with a mental health issue are most certainly not abused uh, or mistreated in any way. Um, I believe we still need to implement a lot more proactive um, support services for them. And that's still a journey and in process. But now the flip is teaching them about that. They are still accountable for actions. Correct. Um, And so that's been the flip that I think I have seen. And I think that officers throughout the country recognize that I know that I think really helps the work I do because, you know, a lot of officers are like, well, now this person can do whatever to us and they don't really get a consequence because of their diagnosis. And so yeah, and we don't is, want that. There's all of that stuff. That, that kind of stuff happens in prisons for sure. Well, it happens in education too. Um, you know, kids get passes. I mean, not like a pass to leave campus or anything, but they, they get a pass. They don't necessarily have to face any sort of negative repercussion for the choices they make um, because uh, they are on a 504 or an IEP or something like that. And it's almost like the teachers are now handcuffed. So it's, it, I mean, we see this across environments where tre- people are treated differently and maybe they are given permission to do bad things and not be held accountable because of this this uh, mental health diagnosis. And what you're doing is you're bringing in the dialectic of, yeah, you can have this mental struggle and you're still accountable for the choices you make. So you're you're helping build awareness too. That, but that, that's that is definitely it because it's saying, listen, I will be your, I'm your biggest supporter. I'm standing here supporting you. I want you to have as much support as you can have. I am not changing the reality that people see your actions, not your intentions, and what you're doing if you're harming someone else is not acceptable. I don't want people harming you, but I don't want you harming someone else and justifying it. See, that's where it's never justified. It's kind of easy to really pinpoint that as a clinician because when someone can say, well, I'm struggling, so I have to hurt this. No, you're struggling, so you deserve all the support in the world. You're struggling, you do not deserve to hurt someone else. That's clear and when we make these clear boundaries a lot of times a lot of this stuff from parenting to the work in the prison system is around boundaries let's be clear there are choices there are consequences we definitely need to be consistent i really personally believe we should do it all with compassion that's why i talk about those four c's when you did the video you did a tedx talk some years ago when you first started this work and um one of the things that you show in the video is and i show this video regularly to lots of audiences uh most frequently to the, uh, the police academy that I that I help instruct here in Northern Nevada, um, but it, you showed a statistically significant reduction in assaultive behaviors in whatever your control population was at that time. Are we still seeing those reductions in assaultive behaviors throughout the system now? So I will say that I have not. We they still can go back because they have all the control. Um, stuff if they want to go back and take the numbers on that. I can tell you anecdotally, we are seeing constant improvement every time. I mean, like every time, every prison I've gone to, I'm excited to start a new prison here uh, next week where, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but it's also going to be something that's going to be rewarding. We're seeing this constantly. Um, I, I've been I've been in contact with some of the, the last prison I was in with both inmates officers and um some of the staff that's mental health staff psychologists um we're seeing some of those changes maybe at a better rate than ever i, I will say uh, obviously if I, if it was just in it for me for like um uh, name in the field or something i'd probably be really attacking doing journals and all that stuff i kind of just love the work i do i'm less concerned about convincing anybody about this and more concerned about just making the impact um, that's so, really saying something, man, because that's pretty rare. Like a lot of us in our field, particularly, but I think America, Western society in general, really wants credit. You know, we want to brag about the stuff we've done, and you're you're just in it to make Earth better. You know, that's that's pretty remarkable. 
seeing this system change, I mean, to see, I heard from a superintendent the other day, 